Democracy. This is APAC, Australia's public affairs channel. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement to country to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land, and to pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, my name is George Williams. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of New South Wales, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this really interesting seminar we're going to have tonight. Uh, in doing so, uh, I'd like to thank you for coming to recognise our many alumni in the room, our many supporters, our partners in this area. I'd also like particularly to say thank you to our hosts, uh, Wooden and Kearney, who we're delighted are uh, looking after this event tonight. We've got one of their team on our panel, and uh, we thank you, for the, thank you for the venue to enable us to host it. Our second Look Who's Talking event tonight is on history, headlines and the law, what's shaping refugee policy in Australia. And this is a topic that is very important to the Faculty of Law at the University of New South Wales. It's a topic that in particular uh, is a central component of the work of our Andrew and Renata Caldor Centre for International Refugee Law, and I'm delighted that Andrew and Renata are here tonight. Um, it's an area where we as a faculty want to explore not only what the law is, what the policy is, but to leave our mark. Uh, the goal of that centre and of the faculty is to help Australia and indeed other nations um, strive towards a more humane, sustainable way of responding to the refugee crisis that is occurring in so many places in the world. And this session tonight is a really important and different take on some of those events. Not just focusing on what's happening today, and it's so easy in these debates to be reactive, to be looking at the latest horror, wherever it might be occurring, to be responding to the latest plight of someone who might be fleeing to Australia, but often without a sense of context. How have we got here? What have we done in the past? And one of the advantages tonight is to put the events of recent times in perspective. And in doing so, to ask, is it possible perhaps to look at these things differently? Are there other paths to what we're actually on in Australia today? What we're going to do tonight is we'll have a panel discussion where I'll introduce our panellists, ask some questions, and then we'll open it to the floor. And we're really pleased to ask you to contribute with your own questions and thoughts on what we're going to be discussing tonight. Afterwards, I'd invite you to stay behind. We've got refreshments at the end. If you'd like to talk more to our speakers, I'd invite you to do so. Uh, what I'll do now, though, is I'll introduce our panel. We've got firstly Ben Doherty, who is a correspondent, photographer, video journalist, and currently working as the immigration correspondent for The Guardian. Among his many distinctions, he is a UNSW Law alumnus and holds a Master of International Law and International Relations. We've also got uh, Dr Claire Higgins. She's a Senior Research Associate at the Andrew and Renata Caldor Centre for International Refugee Law. And her book, which is pride of place at the back of the room and will be on sale later, is Asylum by Boat, Origins of Australia's Refugee Policy. We've then got Professor Guy Goodwin-Gill. He's a professor of law at the University of New South Wales, formerly of Oxford University. He's the acting director of the Caldor Centre for International Refugee Law and uh, an eminent authority in this field. And we're really delighted that he's with us at UNSW Law and on this panel tonight. And finally, we've got Heidi Nash-Smith, who is a pro bono and corporate social responsibility partner at our event hosts, Wooden and Kearney. So what I'll do now is I'll start with some questions to the panel. Uh, my first question is to Claire. Uh, Claire, your book has a really interesting perspective on the debates today, but it comes at it from the late 1970s. That's the period in which you focus upon. At that time, though, the Australian government faced many of the same concerns we are facing today. An unknown people, number of refugees arriving in Australia by sea, uncertainty about whether they would be welcomed in Australia, fear of deaths at sea, and bureaucrats who served up many of the same options that we're seeing today uh, to the Fraser government. What parallels do you see as relevant with that era and how do you think that era helps us understand what we're going through today? Thank you, George. So I was researching a period when Australia first responded to the sustained arrival of asylum seekers by boat, and that was when the Vietnamese were sailing to Australia in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And as George said, uh, the concerns expressed today that we might hear about deaths at sea or the potential number of people coming, they were expressed back then as well. And public opinion was a very strong factor back then as well on either side of the asylum policy debate. But as George said, the policy options that we have in place now, turnbacks and detention, 
they were put forward back then, as I found when I did my archival research at the National Archives in Canberra. And the lesson that we can learn from history, the way that history can illuminate our analysis of policy today, is that those options of turnbacks and detention were rejected within the Immigration Department for the same reasons they should be rejected today. Turnbacks, for example. The then Minister for Immigration, Michael McKellar, said publicly in his speeches and at town hall meetings, turn back to where? And that is an essential question that remains unanswered. In terms of detention, the then Secretary of the Department of Immigration, as I found pouring through the archives, laid out four reasons why detention would not work. He said it would create a political problem, and that has been borne out. He said it would not deter asylum seekers, and we can see that that has been borne out. He said detention would not provide a genuine solution to forced migration, and we can see that that has been proven. And he also said publicly to an address in Canberra that there is no way that we can detain asylum seekers indefinitely without what he called a tremendous guard apparatus. And we have certainly seen that borne out today. So I think the lessons from history are very rich when we look at this period in comparison to just this week. I mean, Claire, it's almost <coughs> as if you're describing a parallel universe, uh, a, a different Australia, and of course separated by many decades. But why was that time different? Because, of course, presumably the political pressures were quite similar in that the government may have made um, great headway politically by going down a different path. I mean, what made the government resist taking those options compared to governments today? I think it really does come down to leadership, to a very deliberate choice to use a humanising language, to speak about people who were coming by boat as though they were us, to encourage the Australian people to see that we would do the same thing if we were in that position having to flee our home country. So it was very much political leadership by um, those in government and the Department of Immigration was more than happy to facilitate that more positive approach. And were there dissenting voices at that time to the political leadership suggesting going down this more benevolent path? There were certainly the same kind of more extreme views that we might see today about people confronting the minister at town hall meetings saying, can't you get the Navy to go out there and, and um, shoot the boats and, and turn people back forcibly? And he explicitly rejected those ideas. So it really came down to setting an example and speaking about this issue in a rational and measured way. Uh, Guy, your perspective also is, is very interesting and again has a, an historical dimension because of course you spent time in Australia some decades ago and through UNHCR. I'm just wondering how Australia's working relationship has changed with that organisation since your role here in the 70s and 80s and again the contrast that you might draw across those eras. I suppose the most dramatic change has been that the UNHCR office is now located in Canberra. It used to be in Sydney, which was much preferable, um, <laughs> certainly when I was here. But I arrived in September 1978 as the first UNHCR official to be posted in Australia, and that was at the invitation of the Government of Australia, because Australia wanted to make sure that it was complying with international standards when it determined the refugee status of everyone who arrived uh, uninvited, as they used to say, uh, on the northern shores. So the UNHCR was to be an observer on the determination of refugee status committee. And we had an amazingly good and cooperative and productive relationship. And in those days, Australia, for the reasons that, that uh, Claire has set out in her book, Australia was making a major contribution, as it had done in the past, to the solution of refugee problems worldwide, in particular in Indochina. But it was also making a very positive and progressive contribution to the development of international refugee law. It was thinking proactively and using the instruments available, the UNHCR, its executive committee of states and so forth, to develop proposals for the better protection of refugees and asylum seekers, drawing, of course, on its experience in Indochina. Now that of course has changed and we only have to read the latest uh, reports from UNHCR Canberra and elsewhere to find the representative of UNHCR doing something which is very, very rare indeed, which is coming out in public and openly criticising a country for what was termed its abject failure, what is termed its abject failure in relation to refugee policy. 
Australia, of course, is still making a contribution by resettlement, although in lesser numbers, to the needs of refugees abroad. But that high point, if you like, of a cooperative and productive relationship seems to have disappeared uh, in, in, and been replaced with something else. And again, Guy, do you have any sense as to what has brought about this shift? I mean, you describe entirely different systems and relationships. Um, do you have any sense of why things have changed? At the time of the Indochina refugee crisis in the late 1970s, there was a great groundswell of public opinion in favour of refugees, not just here in Australia, but it was here certainly, but also throughout the world. And indeed, that is what pressured many governments to respond positively to the needs of what became a million Indochinese refugees and displaced who were ultimately resettled. That began to change. That began to change for various reasons. Uh, it began to change in the mid-1980s here in Australia when I think local people began to realise that the country was now a little bit different, that things had happened which they hadn't expected. It was, after all, only a few years since the white Australia policy had been brought to an end. And I think in other countries too, there was the beginning a bit of a reaction to the refugee crisis of Indochina and a need to come up, a felt need to come up with, with alternative solutions, a debate of course that's still going on. And in particular though, what we've seen is that the discourse has very often been hijacked by certain sectors of the media and indeed by government itself, which has sought very often to suppress discussion, open, well-informed discussion on the causes of refugee movements and the causes of refugee onward movements. The desperation that drives people still to take phenomenal risks, risks that endanger themselves, their, their families, their children. One has to stop and ask why do they do that? It's not simply for a better life, it's because behind them there is the desperation of conflict or persecution. And Heidi, you work in this area as a lawyer. I'm just wondering if you can give us a perspective on the system as it is at the moment. I mean, what sort of frustrations or other issues do you see as someone who are dealing with this system on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, to give uh, some context, uh, at Warden Kearney we have a pro bono program which works um, with uh, refugees in three core areas. Um, one relates to uh, assisting people with their claims for protection. The second is assisting with judicial review. So that's where those claims for protection have been refused and there is grounds to say that there was an error in that process, um, a jurisdictional error. Um, and the third uh, area that we're involved in is helping clients who have been detained um, offshore in Nauru or Manus Island and they've been transferred across to Australia for medical treatment. Um, we then work with them to um, file applications in the High Court to prevent their removal back offshore where there is a risk of significant harm to those individuals. Um, in relation to the, the challenges that we see there and the frustrations that we have, um, there's so much uncertainty for us and for our clients. The legal framework changes and it can change overnight. And so the legal need suddenly becomes imminent and we need to um, work with our community legal center partners, with other pro bono lawyers, and find a way to meet that need. So one of the examples of that is the um, 1 October deadline that was brought in as part of the legacy caseload. Suddenly we had thousands and thousands of people across Australia who had to get their applications um, for protection submitted before the 1st of October or they would be deported. Um, this meant we saw legal centres like Refugee Legal in Victoria, the Refugee Advice and Casework Service in New South Wales, um, setting up really round-the-clock clinics to help people put in those applications. And as pro bono lawyers, um, we upskilled and helped with that process. The most challenging and frustrating part for me personally and with um, and I feel for, for a lot of our lawyers who are involved in this area is with the clients um, who are brought over from Manus and Nauru. Um, we are dealing with people who have been detained for four years in absolutely horrific circumstances. The impact on their mental health and well-being is just awful and they feel a lack of hope and a complete lack of certainty about what their future is. Many of our clients have been determined to be refugees. Um, they have continued to be in detention. Um, they have done nothing wrong, and yet they're being treated like criminals. And I speak to them on the phone and they say, what have I done wrong? 
Why am I so hated? Why, why what, what, what does my life hold? Where, you know, will, I be, will I be released? Will, you know, will I find a home? Will I be able to study to build a life for myself? Or is this, is this it? And, and I don't have an answer for them. And that is extremely challenging and extremely frustrating. And, and how do you deal with that personally? I mean, dealing with distressed people is obviously part of your job. Mm. And you've described a situation where often you can't help those people, yet despite feeling empathy and concern for them. Yeah. I mean, how, as a professional, do you deal with that? It's not easy. Uh, um, you really have to reach out to your own support networks. And so um, within the firm, you know, the others who are working on the matters, we sit and we talk about it and we share the experience and support each other. Um, as lawyers, we also have access to counselling services and we also have um, friends and family who listen to us and help support us and make sure that we have the resilience to step up and have those conversations again tomorrow. Uh, ben, one of the things that Guy mentioned in talking about the shift in Australia is that key change in public attitudes that we've seen from the 1970s, the sympathy at that point, to a, a very different sense, at least as portrayed in the media today. I'm just wondering what has led to that shift, and in particular, is it too easy to blame the media? Is the media a, a, a key cause of why we've moved to this far less tolerant, less sympathetic outcome? Is it really the tabloids and others that are causing the problem? Or uh, really, from a media perspective, what do you think the media's role has been? Uh, uh, look, uh, I think treating the media as, as a kind of monolithic whole, as though it's, it's one entity, is, is, is probably problematic. The media, like any institution, has a, has a, a sort of range of views around this. But I think um, the point about the change in language has been very, very... And as, and as media practitioners, we, we, we work with language every day, and you know, not to get to Wittgenstein about it, but, but words make worlds and you can hugely change someone's understanding of something by the way you talk about it. But it's not just the tabloid media, but this is these are ministers of the Crown, this is the immigrant, this is departments using this sort of language. And you only need to go back and, and, and read the, the speeches that Claire was alluding to, you know, when, when, when McKellar was minister, talking about uh, asylum seekers arriving as a, as a humanitarian obligation or talking about international legal obligation. Now we hear it talked about as a border protection matter, a national security. It's, it's changed completely the nature of what we're talking about. It's the same phenomenon. It's still people arriving seeking asylum, but the understanding of what's going on is different. And, 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 and the language has been deliberately manipulated for a political end. So we no longer have asylum seekers coming to this country. We have illegals. We don't have an immigration department. We have a border protection force. What does that do to people's understanding of, of, of what's happening here? And I would go even further, in, in, even, even further than just creating a, a political space to be able to, to sort of de demonise and, and dehumanise this group of people. It really is, in a lot of ways, the fundament of the policy. If, you, if somebody's an illegal, as a government, it doesn't just give you the right to detain them, it gives you the obligation almost. So a, a policy like indefinite mandatory detention, which is what this country has, a policy like offshore, or de offshore detention, it doesn't work unless you've got illegals that need to be locked up. If you've got asylum seekers seeking sanctuary, then, then, then indefinite detention doesn't make sense. So in a lot of ways, the language, the way this issue is constructed has been crucial in actually constructing the policies themselves. So I don't think you can underestimate how influential that change in language has been to public understanding. And, I mean, is it possible to even have fair and balanced reporting in this area anymore when there's such a difference of opinion on whether these are illegals or other adjectives that might be used, and so much of it now is a polarised debate mm. and, and base differences of just basic factual matters? Mm. Um, I mean, where yeah. do you go when you well, seek it, fair it, and look, balanced reporting? It, it's right. You know, we live in, we live in a world of alternative facts. Um, uh, and, and it is, it is re I, I came back from, from uh, postings overseas to find this incredibly divided and divisive de debate around this where people can't even agree on the basic facts of what's happening and that, that makes it really difficult. And I think being um, prescriptive about the language people need to use, saying you must call them this or you must call them that's a very dangerous path to be treading down. But I think there needs to be a consciousness in, in public debate about the way people are being described because um, so often in the debate around asylum seekers and refugees, um, we're hearing so much, we're, we're hearing so often people talking about them rather than, than these people speaking themselves. So um, it's very difficult for refugees themselves to be shaping the narrative around their lives when they're in detention on Manus and Nauru. And so the words that people use about them become very, very powerful. 
And uh, so I suppose, apart from reading The Guardian, mm. um, have you got any suggestions for people as to how you know, no, they can form their it. own views? Just read The Guardian. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fine. Um, <laughs> no, look, of course, read, read widely and broadly and, and, and talk to people about this issue. And, and I think that's one of the things we've lost in this, in this debate politically and more broadly in this country, we, we've lost the ability to sort of disagree and, and democracies are founded on disagreement and people being able to debate an issue and, and to be able to understand another person's position. And I think by digging into trenches and hurling sort of invective, you know, invective at each other, these rhetorical bombs, no one gets anywhere. People just dig in further. There needs to be an effort to really properly discuss this because otherwise, as, as we've, we've been seeing for generations, the, the politics will continue to poison the policy. And when it comes back to the politics, you've mentioned the change in language of our politicians over the time. Claire, I'm, I'm wondering whether you can tell us a little bit more about the sorts of words, the language that political leaders and departments have used and how that shifted from the 70s through to the current era. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as Ben was saying, what we see now is a dehumanised, very securitised language around asylum seekers or illegal maritime arrivals. That idea of control... Which, which this language is trying to uh, emphasise. That is a running theme in Australian immigration history. It was a, a founding pillar um, at Federation, control of entry. So the period that I've been looking at, when the Vietnamese asylum seekers were sailing to Australia, control was still very much emphasised in the minister's language in departmental press releases, but it was done in a very different way. It was all about humanising those who were coming here and assuring the public that rigorous status determination procedures had been set up and were in place and that everyone coming here was being um, assessed against Australia's um, uh, obligations under the Refugee Convention and everyone settling in your neighbourhood on your street deserved protection. And that was how control was emphasised. It was completely, a completely different, a 180 from what we see today. And I think that's um, very much a lesson to be learnt from that period of history as well. And of course, one of the big shifts in control is not just controlling the people, but the messages yes. and indeed their capacity to communicate. And, and Ben, you've already talked a little bit about some of these issues, but I want to follow on from Claire's point about humanising the people involved. I mean, as a reporter or, or as someone trying to tell a story, how do you tell a story? How do you humanise when, in fact, you can't actually speak mm. to the people at the centre of this and it may not be possible to show their image yeah. or to even listen to their voice? Yeah, look, it, it, and, and, and that's not an accidental situation that, you know, that, that the detention centres in Australia are built very, very far away um, with, with uh, a few exceptions and, and Nauru and PNG are very hard to get to. Um, I'm not allowed a visa to either of those countries. Um, uh, but um, I, I have to say that, that um, one of the things that, that also, you know, we live in a world of, of sort of, you know, bounded territoriality. One of the things about being an asylum seeker refugee is you, you often lose a lot of agency with that as well. But, but, the, but refugees and asylum seekers are people of extraordinary ability and, and they don't need me or anybody else telling their stories for them. In a, in a lot of cases, um, they are perfectly adequate of prosecuting their, their own case and, and telling their stories. And, and the great example is um, an Iranian journalist who's on Manus at the moment, most of you I think will know, called Beruz Bujani. Um, I had the slightly strange honour of accepting uh, an Amnesty International Media Award on his behalf last night. Um, he is an extraordinary journalist of, of, of immense dedication and commitment and passion. Um, and he has, um, through all sorts of means, found a way to tell his story publicly. We have him this week in, in The Guardian writing a diary every day of, of you know, the last days of the detention centre in Manus. Um, uh, and and uh, I think the idea that, that refugees need their stories told for them or, or that they need some sort of benevolent hand to do that is often unhelpful. Guy, I've heard you say before in other fora about um, not uh, what you do to us but with us. And I, I think refugees uh, need to be part of that conversation very prominently and in a lot of cases are their own best advocates. People like Beruz, um, there are guys on, on, on Nauru. Um, we have lots of ways of getting in touch with them. Some of them I can talk about and some of them I can't. But um, uh, um, <laughs> they are resourceful and industrious and, um, and it's amazing what you can get out of those places. And is that an indication, in fact, that the level of control over the message from the department in Australia is slipping? I mean, is more now possible than it was a year or so ago? I mean, it does seem that more mm. messages and voices are getting out, but 
is that a function of the Manus collapse itself and the closure of the detention centre? What, what shifted? Yeah, look, uh, um, a little bit. I, I think an awareness that, uh, that an, an effort to completely control things um, was going to be impossible. I, I think the fact that Nauru has become an open centre, um, that the Manus centre was ruled uh, you know, illegal and, un, uh, and unconstitutional, meant that you, you couldn't keep phones off people, and, and, and that's certainly the, the, the sort of main way that people have been able to get messages out. Um, uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it is a function of the, the sort of the fraying and, and the gradual decay of, of the whole system, I think. Well, maybe, maybe our politicians have taken their eye off the ball. There are other things about citizenship at the moment <laughs> that uh, may be occupying them. Um, we've talked a lot about the Australian debate, of course, but we're talking about the Australian debate which really needs to be cast in relief of a much larger international debate where often we underestimate just what significance the Australian debate may have, indeed some of the bad examples um, that we're setting here. Um, Guy, I'm just wondering how Australia's approach to asylum seekers um, has changed our perceptions of international law here or indeed whether we are ourselves contributing to changes in the international system. I think on the, on the one hand it can certainly be said that Australia has and is challenging the, the framework that exists for the response and solutions to refugees. Indeed, it is by doing its, by instituting its mandatory detention policy, it has, amongst other things, thrown a spanner in the works, particularly when it then backed that up by denying any possibility of asylum to those who might be intercepted and castrated. No other state does that. And no other state sees that as being within the bounds of the law. This is something different. But no other state likewise, even though some of them might perhaps think it's a good idea, is moving in that direction. Now, many other states, of course, have the advantage, or perhaps some of the politicians see it as a disadvantage, of being bound quite clearly by international rules and obligations. For example, under the European Convention or the American Convention on Human Rights. There are some things that they just can't get away with. Nonetheless, the challenges are the same, and we are all facing the challenges of the movement, the increasing movement of people between states, and that is not going to go away. You just need to look at the projected increases in world population and in particular projected increases in those of working age. People are going to move. They're going to move because they are desperate to do so, fleeing conflict uh, under or unemployment for all sorts of reasons. And we're going to have to come up with more positive, better responses in Australia and else, elsewhere. And I think what we've seen is the bankruptcy of the policy that has been hitherto adopted. It doesn't lead anywhere. And what also we've seen, in adding to what Heidi's own personal experience has revealed for us also, what we've seen is a government, it seems to me, and there's a history here also to be written, uh, deliberately doing what they knew would result in injury and harm because mandatory indefinite detention has been tried before in this country and elsewhere, and it is known to produce serious injury to those who are affected by it. And yet we have a government, we have functionaries who are prepared to go down that path. And it does lead me to wonder about their, not only their personal moral responsibility, but potentially in the future at least, their possible legal liability for so causing harm to others. And thank you for the reference to history there. I'm sure Claire's got an idea for another um, history book. But uh, Guy, one of the shifts we've also seen in Australia is that not so long ago it was an article of faith amongst our parliamentarians that of course we had to comply with the Refugee Convention, even if they weren't. They weren't prepared to acknowledge that they were not complying. Today that doesn't seem to be such a factor and in fact there's not the same attempts to even cast the fig leaf over our policies to say that these really are compliant. In other words, if we're not compliant it's not such an issue politically for them. Yeah. I'm wondering whether that actually indicates almost a crisis of faith in that refugee convention. Is it fit for purpose in the modern world if the compliance and the desire to comply is no longer there? I think the fig leaf is still there. It might have shriveled a bit, but I think it is still there. Um, and when, in my first experience of Australian policy and practice, I mean, the process had a much stronger interdepartmental dimension than I think it has today. I mean, the Dawes Committee enjoyed the membership of the Attorney General's Department, Foreign Affairs, Prime Minister, Cabinet, and so forth. And it, it reflected a, a very coherent, I think, on the whole, not entirely always consistent policy, but nonetheless a coherent policy towards refugees and asylum seekers. And I get the impression that that has changed, that the running is now taken by a single department which just has a single objective in mind. Now, Australia has always been very careful to dress up its policies and practices within the terms of international refugee law. There's no doubt about that. And that is an area of perpetual tension. That's normal. That's natural. States necessarily are frequently looking to their own interests and seeking, therefore, to limit the scope of the obligations which they have nonetheless freely undertaken. And it's in that tension that I think you see you know, create creativity very often and hopefully you see progress. Not always. 
But in that dy dynamic, I think, that's where you see development. And we have seen international refugee law develop very positively, with Australian courts, I must say, playing a part from time to time in that development. Uh, I see no suggestion at the moment that, the, the, that Australia is intending to, as it were, denounce or, or get out of the refugee convention. Not that that, I think, would help one way or the other, because there will still be people in need of protection, still be need people fleeing persecution and conflict, and still be questions about what to do next. And I'm not aware, and if you boil the Fit Refugee Convention down to its essence, what you have is a definition of who is a refugee, which is, is certainly held up over time. No one denies that those with a well-founded fear of persecution are refugees. And you have a basic principle of not returning refugees to where their lives or freedom would be threatened. And I don't know anyone who is seeking to challenge that basic principle at the present moment. There are deficiencies in the regime in relation to the sharing, if you like, of responsibility. Uh, that is something which the UN General Assembly is looking at at the moment, seeing whether it can come up with a global compact on refugees which will put in place a mechanism that would allow a much more equitable sharing of the responsibility for protecting refugees and finding solutions for refugees. Up to now, and this has been the history of nearly 100 years, uh, the process has had an element of ad hocery in it. And that's not been helpful. We need to be, to be able to rely on much more predictable responses among states. And that's a place where, given its historical record, Australia could have played, might even still be able to play, a major and a positive role. But it has somewhat shot itself in the foot with its policies on asylum seekers. And uh, last question to Heidi before I open it up to the audience for Q&A. Um, Heidi, we've talked about a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. I'm just wondering what role you think the legal profession that lawyers can play in helping to improve this system and to drive a, a better outcome for refugees and people involved? Yeah, I think that there are three main areas that, um, that come to mind. The first one is advocacy. And I think um, Julian Burnside is, um, tells this story best, and he says how he was at an event once and um, someone approached him and said, you know, do you think it's appropriate for um, a barrister to speak publicly about these issues, these issues being about uh, refugee um, rights? And he said, you know, do you think it's right to know of these things, to know what's going on and to stay silent? And I think that's where we all, not just lawyers, but we all have a role to play. Um, we know what's happening in Australia. We know what's happening on Manus and Nauru. And we have um, not only a, a, a role um, to, to step up and advocate, I think we have a, an obligation. We, we, we can't stay silent when these atrocities are occurring in our country. Um, the second area is, is education. And this comes back to really what Ben was saying about this, this lack of debate um, that we're having. There's um, all this lack of sort of almost civilized debate where we actually talk about things without sort of pointing fingers and, and it being blame and it being personal. But to, to educate and, and to um, facilitate open discussion. So something we've introduced here is a, a refugee rights focus group where once every three months we have someone come in and, and speak to us and just educate us about what's happening um, in the refugee space and to prompt discussion, to, to prompt further thought and for us to make our own minds up about what we can do and what we think about the policies. Um, and then the third area, um, as lawyers, I think we have, um, a, again, a professional responsibility to promote access to justice. And so if you have the opportunity to get involved in pro bono work or to lend support to the community legal centers who are doing wonderful work um, advocating for um, refugee rights, then do so. Right, thank you. And I could certainly add from an academic perspective, even arguing for law reform, of course, as well, which is what our Caldor Center does. I mean, I, I saw that directly in one case. I actually was involved arguing as a barrister, a case called Plaintiff S157, where we were arguing for people to have access to justice, to have their day uh, in court. And in appearing before the High Court in that case, we realised that the tools were so thin that we could not, there were no human rights we could use to argue for something as basic as that. And in fashioning our argument in the High Court, we actually made the strategic decision we would not once mention the words human rights because we felt it would be so detrimental mm. to our case if we were to mention that. It would be seen as the refuge of the desperate. Instead, we cast the argument that the legislation was an attack on the jurisdiction of the High Court, and we won. Mm. 
But it just shows in this area that the advocacy is so stunted, you can't even mention human rights in these areas. You do what you can, which emphasises the need for advocacy and law reform, because arguing for refugees' rights without a human rights framework is really hard in Australia and explains why we often don't get very far in some of the most basic cases. But look, thank you to our panellists. What we're going to do now is open it up to questions from the audience. We've got a roving mic. Um, if you could just briefly say where you're from, who your question is addressed to, and be delighted to hear from you. Who'd like to kick us off? Yes, we've got a question down here. Thanks very much uh, to all the, the speakers. Uh, Lawrence Bull, teaching fellow at UNSW Law. Uh, in this morning's Guardian, and this is not a planted question, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a reference, I think, to a new category of refugee visa uh, for those uh, who, in a sense, have to leave you know, hearth and home for, for environmental and climate change reasons. Now, I know that's complicating and a really complex issue, but I'm just wondering what, what the feeling is about the possibility of that, of that developing, that idea of it developing. Uh, yeah, look, um, it's, I think it's something that, that a lot of people around the world are seized of and discussing because um, the, the refugee, uh, Refugees Convention, um, as, as Guy says, you know, quite strictly defines what a refugee is and you need to be uh, under a, a well-founded fear of, per of persecution and, and, and the sea coming in your front door. Um, doesn't meet that. Um, but we are seeing, and we, we've already seen a, a great number of people around the world being forced to leave for, for environmental reasons, and, 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 and in particular in the Pacific, um, and people are sort of having the debate around if it's Kiribati and Tuvalu, where can, where can those countries be, the, those people be resettled, but if it's Bangladesh that's, that's, that's being displaced, and you're know, talking 165 million people in India's built a fence around, uh, around that country, how do you resettle those sort of numbers, um, and what sort of framework do you put in place? Now, the best person to talk about it is two to my right. Um, Guy has written a very authoritative paper on this very issue. <laughs> is that a cue? <laughs> I think it is. Actually, with, I, I, I wrote a paper with Jane McAdam, who is the director of the Caldor Centre and currently on leave and has done, is one of the pioneers in this area of, of climate change related displacement. And on the one hand, on the positive side, I mean, I think what we see is while, as Ben has said, the Refugee Convention is, it was not framed with that sort of refugee in mind. Nonetheless, there has been a great deal of discussion under the auspices of something called the Nansen Initiative and now the Platform for Disaster Displacement on what to do in relation to climate change. Now, one of the many challenges, of course, in this, in this context is to differentiate for sudden onset disasters, for example, and the, the long-term impact of climate change on livelihoods and the necessity of people people to move to, to, to earn a living. I mean, what we have seen, though, under the auspices of the Nansen agenda in particular, is, is progress through discussion and non-binding commitments. 109 states signed on, for example, to what's known as the Agenda for Protection in relation to uh, disaster-related displacement. And that, I think, is a good beginning. It's generally recognised that the refugee framework, as it exists at present, is, is not set up to deal with these challenges. But at the same time, states increasingly recognise that, that those challenges are there and that something will have to be done. So whether that be through a special category of entry or whether it be done through long-term thinking on migration programmes, as New Zealand has done, for example, um, will obviously depend upon context and circumstance. But there is progress there, and I like to think that that will go on. So other questions? Yes, up the back. Um, hi, my name is Karen Zui. I'm a, from UNSW Medicine and a paediatrician rather than a lawyer. Um, I'm just interested in the previous comment about, yes, we do our clinical work, so you do legal work, we do health work, um, but our roles in advocacy and education perhaps have been limited by being siloed to our professional groups. I think we got a brief bit of traction around the 2014 Human Rights Commission around children in detention where lawyers and doctors work together, but I don't feel like we are necessarily optimising, um, you know, the potential of really making a good case for why things should change. That's sort of the first part of the question. The second part is if one were to do that across multiple different disciplines and one could include teachers and social workers and, you know, all, all sorts of people, um, then what is the message? Um, because I find in this fairly toxic context even a good news message, such as that refugee children, for example, as I've shown in my research, are doing extremely well and by two or three years after arrival are actually doing better than our Australian children, 
instead of being seen as a positive message, can actually be seen as quite a scary message. Um, so whichever way you put it, you know, they're similar to what Peter Dutton said, they're either unemployed or they're taking out jobs. Um, it's it's very hard to find the message that actually goes right down the middle and brings people together rather than m makes people frightened. So there's a couple of interesting questions there, Ben. I might get you to come in on the second half of that in a moment in terms of the messaging. Is there a way through the middle of this and communicating this and reporting it? But Heidi, uh, would you like to speak to that issue of lawyers working with other professionals, doctors and others? I mean, what are you seeing in this field? I haven't, I haven't seen um, much of that collaboration, and, and there, there should be. I think you're absolutely right. There is uh, absolute scope and need, and the more voices which unite, um, I think the better. And, um, and maybe that is something that we should look at, and um, maybe we should exchange details at the end of, of this and see whether there are ways to actually have a coordinated approach and to start that discussion. Uh, ben and then Claire, if you would also add anything. Look, I, I suppose I, I, I'm not an advocate. I'm a, I'm a journalist, and I need to sort of uh, separate my, my, myself from that. Um, I think there are a lot of people in all sorts of fields doing some extraordinarily um, effective work in, 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 in advocating um, for the rights of, of asylum seekers and refugees. And to, there have been a couple of campaigns um, that have worked really well, and I, I, think, I think a humanising element, and I know sometimes it's very difficult to do that because people have protection claims and, and family elsewhere or can't be identified, but something like the Baby Asher case um, in, in Queensland was incredibly powerful because people were able to see this little child who was born in Australia um, and doctors were saying, you can't take her back to that unsafe place. And, you know, there was, um, uh, and, and they were basically you know, refusing... They, they did. They refused to, to discharge this child. That, that sort of... Um, uh, humanisation of this issue, that this is a little girl who just wants a chance to grow up in, in a place where she's safe, I think is very, very powerful. Um, I, of course it's important to talk um, about, about the, the legal principles and the framework and all of those sort of things, but the way for, for a message to resonate with people is to make it human. In other words, fewer lawyers, even if the <laughs> lawyers are human. But uh, no, I agree completely. Certainly in my experience, the more the lawyers are involved, the harder it is to convey the message. Powerful human stories is what cuts through. But Claire, is there anything you want to add? I did want to add one thing, George, which is that uh, from my perspective, I think there's considerable strength in a diversity of scholarship. Just to have scholars in different disciplines working together, they can benefit from one another's research. For example, um, how can we possibly encourage politicians and policy makers and the public to really understand the meaning of the principle of non-refoulement, of not sending someone back to a place where their <coughs> life or freedom may be threatened unless we have research on conditions, return-oriented conditions in Australian detention centres or offshore detention centres to truly, to truly understand um, how that may play out in practice or to understand how decision makers interpret uh, the convention or other instruments in their decision on someone's fate. So the Caldor Centre has an emerging scholars network to unite um, graduate and early career researchers working in the very broad field of forced migration studies in many different disciplines purely for that purpose, to bring people together so we can learn from one another's work and see how it all fits together. And I should say, as the Dean of UNSW Law, I'm delighted that we have Claire, who's a historian, which is a, you know, a great example of exactly what we need to do, and that her book has emerged from a law faculty, speaks, I think, well of lawyers, that we can actually realise that in this area, you know, is actually the history, which is often determinative, and we have too often narrow a focus on these debates. Um, other questions? Down the front? And then we've got a question there, but down the front first. Thanks, Thanks George. Thanks, George. Uh, Tom Liu, I'm at the New South Wales Bar. My question is for Heidi, but also more broadly for the panel as well. One of the insinuations in this debate is that you have a lot of people who are coming to Australia potentially as economic migrants or people who are uh, using the protection visa process as a way of staying in Australia unmeritoriously. So my question is, how do we design a system, but more specifically a legal system, that efficiently and fairly deals with people with meritorious claims, but also treats you know, all the other people with dignity as well. I think that the words you said of um, efficiently and fairly, I think that's where we've fallen down at the moment. It hasn't been an efficient process. Um, 
you know, the, the legacy caseload, the sort of 25,000 people um, who needed their claims to be submitted by the 1st of October of this year, that arose because we had a whole period of time where no claims were being processed. Um, so that's, that's in no way efficient. And having uh, people detained um, for you know, four years plus, some not having had their claims for protection considered yet, that is not efficient. And so any system that um, we have, you, you do need to have, I think, access to early legal advice um, because that will help you articulate your claim. Um, and it can be considered, the, the, as was the, um, if you have a claim which is well articulated, then it's more likely to have a better decision-making process going on, less likely to have chances of um, a need for judicial review and so on further down the line. Um, so I think early access to legal assistance and constructing a process which, um, which does allow claims to be considered promptly rather than this um, endless uncertain system. I also think the, the sort of great error that's been made in a sort of quest for more efficiency, it's become more unfair. Mm -hmm. um, and so people are now subject to the fast track system, which, mm -hmm. which you know, people will have read about, that you know, basically you get one crack at it. Um, and, and people are, you know, on, you know, on September 30, frantically filling out forms at, at midnight to get them in before the deadline is no way to uh, um, to run a system. I, I've, I, I, the evidence doesn't suggest that there is a great number of people coming with unmeritorious claims, and, and certainly it does happen that not all people are found to meet to meet the threshold. Um, uh, but uh, but the, the the figures, you know, if we look at Nara and Manus, for instance, you know, both up, you know, approaching 80% of those cases have been found have gone through, a, you know, an extensive RSD process and been found to have uh, you know, claims for protection. And they're legally owed protection. It's not, it's not a gift. It's not something that's bestowed upon someone. They are legally owed that protection. And that same experience has been found in the Mediterranean as well. I mean, one should not underestimate the numbers of those who are intercepted who actually do have a well-founded claim to protection. And that's, <coughs> that is precisely one of the challenges for government, for, to get to that point quickly and efficiently and effectively so that people can get on with their lives. And the other side, which governments, the Australian government is not alone in this, have failed to, to manage, is the migration issue itself. Because in order to, if you want to implement a migration policy effectively and efficiently, you may need from time to time to return people to their countries of origin. But that is a two-way street, a two-way relationship is required there. And too many countries like to think of this in purely unilateral terms. Well, we'll just send them back. It doesn't work out like that. And countries wonder why they are unable, in fact, to return individuals to their own countries when they have no claim to be amongst them. I think we had a question in the middle here, did we? Yes. Hi, Andy Simmington, student at NSW. Um, Claire, in your book, one of the things that struck me was that uh, one of the concerns of the immigration minister back then was not to damage <coughs> Australia's reputation internationally. Uh, what do you think's changed since then? <laughs> <laughs> I think it really does come down to that, doesn't it? I think that period of history was a transformative moment for Australia because we'd uh, moved on finally from racially discriminatory entry policy and we were coming to terms, government was coming to terms with Australia's obligations under international refugee law and setting up that committee that Guy spoke about to determine people's claims. I think very much it was about rebuilding, reshaping Australia's reputation in the region as well, off the back of white Australia. And so this was a, a confluence of events with the displacement of Vietnamese that, that really cemented um, Australia's desire to improve its reputation through taking refugees. And you can see that in the language in the Department of Foreign Affairs over the years across the 1980s, 1990s, immigration used it as well. Refugees are an important part of our foreign policy and our international reputation is partly um, built on our good record in refugee resettlement. And the problem now is that, and, and we saw this under Philip Ruddick, so it's been um, well over a decade, almost two, that those two things have been separated. So the Minister for Immigration will still talk about Australia's humanitarian resettlement program and its good record on refugee resettlement, um, but as Ben has explained, asylum seekers are uh, framed so differently. Will it make any difference now we're on the Human Rights Council? We're a paragon of, or at least we're meant to be a paragon of good practice in this area? Or, or again, you think that separation will mean that it just won't matter? I think when you look um, at the Department of Immigration and Border Protection's language, they don't talk about human rights. As Guy mentioned, that's been 
the, that element of immigration's role has been completely removed. You'll see it in Attorney Generals, you'll see it in Foreign Affairs when they're talking about Australia's role at these um, UN treaty bodies and other um, bodies, but immigration does not use that term. I, I haven't seen it. the phrase nation building, which as Peter, Peter Hughes, a former, uh, former official in that department, mentioned to me, was their, was their aim and goal when he was in it. It was to build a nation. You don't hear them talking about that any longer either. Well, look, that's good timing. We're coming to time. And uh, I'd like to thank you for the questions that you've had. I'd also like to uh, thank our panellists. Um, and also to thank our event hosts. And uh, we appreciate the firm's generosity uh, in allowing us to use the venue tonight. Um, as I said, we'd invite you to join us for some drinks, um, snacks, talk further to our panellists as well. We've also got Claire and other books up the back for sale. If you'd like to buy a copy, you might even sneak a signature in there from Claire if you'd like. I'd remind you that Christmas is now only a few <laughs> weeks away. It makes a perfect stocking filler for any member of your family. Uh, you can imagine their joy waking up on Christmas morning. Claire's book, Asylum by Boat, Origins of Australia's Refugee Policy, waiting for them on Christmas morning. Um, so thank you again. Please thank our panellists and thank you for coming. Education. Interaction. Understanding. This is APAC, Australia's public affairs channel.